Hi guys. It is a hot, sticky, miserable, yuck day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is Monday, May 9th, 2022, feeling more like August 9th as Texas continues to bake in a springtime heat wave. I guess it's heading to 102 in a few days, but that doesn't bother me because a little dog and I, we are packing up our gas sucking truck, heading to New York, baby, at a crack of dawn tomorrow to beat the heat back to New York. So this will probably be the last time you hear from me for several days. I wasn't uh, planning to uh, even get a chronicle of the collapse today, but I need to take a break before I get heat stroke, and I guess talking about getting heat stroke, this is, uh, you know, my never ending uh, quest to explode the myth of the noble savage. Talking about how pre industrial, uh, or even not even pre industrial, pre agricultural humans lived in harmony with the planet. This is one of the most bizarre stories, uh, taking the word sustainable to a whole new level of idiocy. Uh, from the conversation, we have uh, two anthro an archaeologist, David Wright, together with an anthropologist, Jessica Thompson, reinventing the definition of the word sustainable. So I, I'm going to read this and maybe I don't understand what the definition of sustainable is. Now I don't know if my battery is going to sustain so uh, help me figure this out guys. <clears throat> Early humans used fire to permanently change the landscape tens of thousands of years ago in Stone Age Africa. Yes, yeah, so we're going to go check out the uh, primitive Stone Age noble savages from Sub-Saharan Africa. Fields of rust-colored soil, spindly cassava, small farms and villages dot the landscape. Dust and smoke blur the mountains visible beyond massive Lake Malawi. Here in tropical Africa, you cannot escape the signs of human presence. How far back in time would you need to go in this place to discover an entirely natural environment? Our work has shown that it would be a very long time indeed, at least 85 thousand years, eight times earlier than the world's first land transformations via agriculture. Anybody uh, blaming the state of the planet on the industrial revolution or even the invention of agriculture. Okay, humans were wrecking the planet, what, 75 thousand years before even inventing agriculture to wreck the planet, much less global industrial civilization to do it. Okay, so they just talk about how this is a blend of archaeological and anthropological. Uh, it, it, I, I've always been unclear of the words, but anyway, uh, we're going to skip through some of that. Okay, so whoever these archaeologists and anthropologists and paleo uh, guys and all of that, I don't see a regular biologist on the team or a, just a regular ecologist. This is all human-centric scientists viewing everything from the eyes of a human. Okay, I expect a gorilla uh, would have a different uh, interpretation of, the, of this 
than these human-centric, uh, human primacy people who study humans. All right. So far, we have recovered more than 45,000 stone artifacts here buried one to seven meters below the surface of the ground. The sites we are excavating date to a time ranging from 315,000 to 30,000 years ago known as the Middle Stone Age. This was also a period in Africa when innovations in human behavior and creativity pop up frequently and earlier than anywhere else in the world. Okay, uh, what was going on with the uh, earlier than anywhere else on the planet? How did these artifacts get buried? Why are there so many of them? And what were these ancient hunter-gatherers doing as they made them? Take a wild guess. Uh, Bill Gady might uh, answer the question, what were these ancient hunter-gatherers doing as they made all of these spear points? The word stewpot uh, is somewhere in the answer. I don't know whether they had stew pots or they were just roasting the uh, just roasting the bush meat over the charcoal, which we'll talk about in a minute. The charcoal of all of the former uh, forests that used to be there before they got there. Okay, to answer these questions, we needed to figure out more about what was happening in this place during their time. Hmm. For a clearer picture of the environments where these early humans lived, we turn to the fossil record preserved in layers of mud at the bottom of Lake Malawi. Uh, okay, and do, doing what these people do, they used all of these, uh, you know, stuff from the bottom of the lake to reconstruct ancient environments across the entire basin. Today, this region is characterized by bushy, fire-tolerant open woodlands that do not develop a thick and enclosed canopy. Forests that do develop these, do develop these can canopies harbor the richest diversity in vegetation. This ecosystem, you know, the biodiverse ecosystem, is now restricted to patches <coughs> that still occur at higher elevations. But these forests once stretched all the way down to the lake shore. Huh. Based on fossil plant evidence, we could see that the area around Lake Malawi repeatedly alternated between wet times of forest expansion and dry periods of forest contraction. As the area underwent cycles of aridity driven by natural climate change, the lake, the lake shrank at times to only 5% of its present volumes. But when lake levels eventually rose each time, forest encroached again on the shoreline. This happened time and time again over the last 636,000 years. So this is where climate change deniers, this is where the Alex Jones crowd would say this has nothing to do with humans. You're seeing how these natural variations in aridity and rainfall, this is a natural recurring pattern where forests come and go, come and go, the lake shrinks, it'll come back, and then once it floods, it'll shrink again. Uh, this is a natural pattern that has nothing to do with humans. 
this is how uh, this, this scientific disinformation gets formed. Okay, but we have a fly in the ointment. All right, the mud in the core also contains a record of fire history, meaning what happened when humans arrived into this 630,000 year natural cycle. Okay, the mud also contains a record of fire history in the form of tiny fragments of charcoal. But a, a lot of people don't realize that charcoal in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think it might be the number one leading cause of deforestation in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is called planet nibbling when you have too many people uh, who should never have been born, uh, and, you, you know, taking out the carrying capacity. My guess is the, uh, is the population of modern day Malawi is probably a hundred times what it was 85,000 years ago. Uh, anyway, so 85,000 years ago, those little flecks told us that around 85,000 years ago, something strange happened around Lake Malawi. Charcoal production spiked, as it's doing today on steroids. Erosion increased, and for the very first time in more than half a million years, rainfall did not bring forest recovery. This is exactly what is going on uh, in the Amazon rainforest. When you hear that because of humans, uh, the cause of human pressure, the Amazon rainforest is hitting a tipping point where it's going to disappear and never be able to recover again. It's going uh, to, you know, just to become what Malawi looks like today if you want to see what the Amazon rainforest is going to look like uh, in a few years. Go look at Malawi and you will see Brazil in, in about 30 years. Uh, At the same time this charcoal burst appears in the drill cord record, <coughs> our sites began to show up in the archaeological record, eventually becoming so numerous that they formed one continuous landscape littered with stone tools. Another drill core immediately offshore showed that as site numbers, meaning as human settlements increased, more and more charcoal was washing into the lake. Early humans had begun to make their first permanent mark on the landscape. Fire use is a technology that stretches back at least a million years. Using it in such a transformative way is human innovation at its most powerful. Modern hunter-gatherers, like there are any modern hunter-gatherers, use fire to warm themselves, cook food, and socialize, but many also deploy fire as an engineering tool. Based on the wide scale and permanent transformation of vegetation into more fire tolerant woodlands, we infer this was what these ancient hunter gatherers were doing. That's exactly what they were doing. They were turning the biodiversity rich, naturally occurring closed canopy forest into the denuded moonscape wasteland 
that it is today and has been for 85,000 years as the uh, Amazon rainforest will look like 85,000 years from now because it's never going to recover. We have a, a historical record example of the Amazon rainforest, uh, the Congo rainforest, the New Guinea rainforest. Uh, by converting the natural seasonal rhythm of wildfire into something more controlled, people can encourage specific areas of vegetation to grow at different stages. This so-called, I love this word for the glossary, for the collapse, pyrodiversity. Pyrodiversity establishes miniature habitat patches and diversifies opportunities for foraging. All right, let's make sure we understand this. This diversifies opportunities for humans, for humans to forage. It destroys the biodiversity that was there for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. If through the eyes of an archaeologist or, uh, what's that other one? that I'm always mixing up with archaeologists. Uh, I already, the, the other A word. Uh, this is kind of like increasing product selection at a supermarket, you know, a supermarket for humans. Just like today, changing any part of an ecosystem has consequences everywhere else. With the loss of closed forest, with the loss of closed forest in ancient Malawi 85,000 years ago, or with the loss of closed forest in modern day Brazil or New Guinea, the vegetation became or will become dominated by more open woodlands that are resilient to fire, but these, you know, these new woodlands did not contain, and obviously when the Amazon rainforest and all of the other rainforests tip into this moonscape, do, did not, do not, and will not contain the same species diversity meaning that 95% of the species will uh, go extinct, as, is, as happened in Malawi, but they never talk about that. Uh, there will be a tiny few winners, namely rats. All right, this combination of uh, rainfall and reduced tree cover also increased opportunities for erosion, which spread sediments into a thick blanket known as an alluvial fan. It sealed away archaeological sites and created the landscape you see here today. And now I love how they, uh, uh, the, the editors added in human impacts can be sustainable human impacts can be sustainable. Here is where this archaeologist and this anthropolo uh, anthropologist really start smoking, start smoking the hopium crack pipe. Although the spread of farmers throughout Africa within the last few thousand years brought more landscape and vegetation transformations, we have found that the legacy of human impacts was already in place in Africa tens of thousands of years before, you know, farmers moved in. This offers a chance to understand 
how such impacts can be sustained over very long time scales. Huh. If your idea of sustainability is to take a natural biodiverse, biodiverse species rich closed canopy forest, burn it down, turn it into charcoal, and turn it into a moonscape. Yes, you will be able to sustain a burned out wasteland for 85,000 years. Okay? I'm not denying this if that is your idea of sustainability. If you think turning the Amazon rainforest uh, into what it's getting turned into and, and keeping it that way for 85,000 years is, is uh, your definition of sustainability. Well, uh, besides you being a clueless moron, a human-centric uh, clueless moron, then, I, I mean, who can argue? Alright, uh, save the planet by turning the planet into a burned out wasteland. It's kind of like, you, you know, dig up the planet to save the planet. Most people, hmm, most people associate human impacts with the time after the Industrial Revolution, but paleoscientists have a deeper perspective. With it, researchers like us can see that wherever and whenever humans lived, we must abandon the idea of pristine nature. We must abandon the idea of pristine nature untouched by any human imprint. However, we can also see how humans shaped their environments in sustainable ways over very long periods causing ecosystem transformation without collapse. There you go. Those humans, those creative humans using stone tools. So yes, there you go. We're just going to transform the Amazon rainforest into a burned out moonscape wasteland and that is not the collapse of the Amazon rainforest. It is not a tipping point. It is ecosystem transformation. Do you get it, guys? We're transforming the Amazon rainforest into a burned out moonscape. And we're going to sustain that for 85,000 years. <clears throat> Seeing the long arc of human influence therefore gives us much to consider about not only our past, but also our future. I, I, I can't argue with that. By establishing long-term ecological patterns, conservation efforts related to fire control, species protection, and human food security can be more targeted and effective. Hmm. People, people living in the tropics such as Malawi today are especially vulnerable to the economic and social impacts of food insecurity brought about by climate change, not to mention the fact that Malawi, my guess, has 100 times as many humans as it did 85,000 years ago. By studying the deep past, we can establish connections between long-term human presence and the biodiversity 
that sustains it. And we can also establish connections between long-term human presence and the biodiversity that is destroyed by it. With this knowledge, people can be better equipped to do what humans had already inv innovated nearly 100,000 years ago in Africa. Manage the world around us. Manage the world around us. Transform the God-given natural ecosystem into a burned out wasteland. There you go. And then as long as you've already wasted it, you might as well dig it up to save what's left of the planet. This is absolute garbage. This is hopium soaked, apocalyptic crap. Any other species of our fellow earthling uh, would look at this story and, and, and shake their heads and look into their crystal ball. And I, I have been saying for years that Sub-Saharan Africa is the poster child of collapse. If you want to see what this planet is going to look like 30, 40 years from now, go to Malawi and you will see that. But uh, I'm still waiting for the shave so I can go pack up my gas sucking truck. Bye guys.